Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you as always for the ability to gather together around your word uh, as we continue to study uh, Luke's gospel, uh, looking forward also to the, the writing of the book of Acts. Um, we ask that you continue to bless our time together, help us to gain appreciation of what St. Luke has accomplished uh, through you. Um, and then also uh, we ask that today as we hopefully kind of finish up the temptations of our Lord Jesus, uh, that we uh, come to a greater understanding of what it means to have a God who knows our temptations, knows our struggles, has felt our pains, um, and, and the comfort that we have when your Son promises to never leave nor forsake us. Uh, we thank you uh, for your presence, we thank you for your comfort, uh, and we thank you for the joy that, uh, as we talked about this morning in regard to St. Mark, the joy that we can have as Christians, even in the midst of things uh, that we don't understand, even in the midst of trials, tribulations, and sufferings, uh, that we can still be joyful yet uh, of the, the consolation that we have in your word uh, and the eternal life that your Son has gained for us, where we will be in your presence forever and ever. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so it's been a little bit <laughs> since we've gotten to meet, and that's okay. Uh, kind of get us caught up. Um, hopefully you grabbed a couple nuggets in the prayer. Uh, um, we were uh, in uh, Luke chapter 4 and discussing the temptations of our Lord. Uh, and we went through uh, the first couple temptations. Uh, who can tell me what's, remind me what the first temptation of Jesus is? In Luke's gospel. Anybody remember? If you need a hint, look at number four on your notes. <laughs> Stone into bread, right? Stone into bread. Why, why, why would that be the first one the devil kind of sticks at Jesus? Hunger. Hunger, right? Jesus has been fasting in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. So you remember, we get uh, uh, Jesus... Uh, baptism, where, where we have a beautiful picture of the Trinity, uh, the Father's voice coming down from heaven, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased, the Spirit descending on our Lord as a dove, and then our Lord being whisked away to the desert to fast for 40 days and 40 nights, and then at his weakest, Satan comes to try to turn the screws to him. That should be not surprising to us. When does Satan come to us? <laughs> when we're nice and strong and our faith is going great? Is that when he tries to kick us around? Oh, absolutely not. Uh, we, can, we can call the devil many things. Stupid is probably not one of them, other than the fact of you're going up against the Almighty God, so <laughs> maybe not the best battle to pick. Uh, but he's certainly not dumb when he, when he fights with us and contends with us on this earth. And so uh, the devil comes at Jesus when Jesus is weak, uh, when he's beaten down by hunger, and the first thing that he offers is to turn bread, or stone into bread, right, so that he may eat. Um, the second one, what's the second one that we do? Authority over the world. Yeah, authority over the world, right? Uh, in the Gospels, Jesus will often talk about Satan as the prince of this world. Um, or, uh, in one of the probably lesser known allusions to this, when Jesus talks about the strong man and the stronger man. Satan is the strong man. He, he has laid hold to this world. All you have to do is watch the news for five minutes and you know that Satan has got a hold of this world, right? Uh, and so we, we see here Satan offering this worldly glory to our Lord Jesus, uh, who is able to reject that. Now we get into, um, well, before that, we actually have to get through um, Deuteronomy 6 through 9. Uh, all of the quotations that Jesus gives from Scripture are from Deuteronomy chapter 6 through 9. Um, and I think a few weeks ago, when we had our last class, I had told you, hey, maybe a, uh, a neat thing to do is to look through that. Uh, did anybody actually do that? And if they did, <laughs> did they remember three weeks later uh, about what was going on there? So, uh, what, Mark. Well, it's about basically reminding the Jews of what was given to them as promised to their forefathers. Yeah. And that even though they took advantage of everything the <laughs> Lord gave them, they were not always right. Yeah, so, so 
Deuteronomy 6 through 9, oh, what's the setting of, of Deuteronomy? What's happening in the life of Israel? Yeah, Egypt, or they've been called out of Egypt and they're wandering, right? This is the wandering in the desert. Also big, big in Deuteronomy 6 through 9 is the establishment of, of the religious services, right? To keep the people in the faith during this time of wandering. And so we've got several neat things going on here. Um, we've got a, a reminder of God's faithfulness in these chapters of Deuteronomy. We have a, a tie-in uh, of what God has done and continues to do. Uh, and uh, usually this reminder of faithfulness is in uh, response to Israel grumbling about something or being upset about something. Uh, you can remember maybe the, the crying over food, longing, longing for the meat pots in Egypt, right? I'd rather go and be enslaved than be free and a little hungry, right? <laughs> right? Uh, uh, and God rains down manna from heaven, right? Um, also, they're crying for water and uh, God producing water out of the rock of Horeb. Uh, I don't think it is any coincidence that Jesus is citing these passages and he is the bread of life that satisfies in the way that the manna cannot satisfy. That he is the water of life and those that come to him, remember when he's talking to the woman at the well, right? Those who come to me shall never ever thirst again. Uh, I don't think there's any coincidence there. I think this is very pointed and beautiful uh, and shows the coherence of our, of our God's word uh, to us. Uh, it also uh, is being used by Luke certainly to tie Jesus as the not only the new Moses but the, the greater Moses, right? Uh, Moses as he should have been. And so you get all of these things and quotations of aspects of what, of what we would think about as uh, Israel's divine service, the worship life. Uh, so, I think what we're seeing here is, one, um, we should be trusting in God to provide for everything, right? Even when we go without some earthly want or need, we trust that God will provide, right? Jesus talks about this, right? Think of the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. If the Lord provides for these, how will he not also provide for you, whom he loves so much more? Um, and so, there is this sense of, of not clamoring after things of this world and to always put uh, put our Lord first, right? Jesus also says, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all of these things, meaning clothing and shoes and house and home and wife and cheerio, children, as Luther talks about, land, animals, and the like in our catechism. All of those things will be added, but we seek God's kingdom first, right? We don't, we don't put God's kingdom and his righteousness on the back burner and go pursuing after all of these earthly things, uh, because they tend to fail us time and time again, right? Uh, uh, I like Chinese food. I eat Chinese food. And what happens if you like Chinese food and you eat Chinese food? What happens an hour later? Hungry. You're hungry again, <laughs> right? So it doesn't matter how much you put in, you're going to get hungry again. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you drink a lot of water like I try to, uh, you're continually thirsty, right? You get thirsty again. It's not like you could take a sip and go, ah, all right, I'm good for the day. We're, we're great. Um, that comes after the Chinese food. It does come after the Chinese food. Yeah, a lot of water. Yeah, uh, especially if you like to get things as spicy as I do. The water comes during the Chinese food. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I usually tend to ask them to make it how they would make it uh, if they were making it for themselves, which is usually how you get the best stuff. Um, and so all of these earthly things that we fill ourselves up, and, and so those were necessities that I named off, but even the unnecessary things like, you know, clamoring after possessions or promotions or things like that, um, they never leave us satisfied. We are always wanting more. You know, as Lord Tennyson said in the beautiful poem, absolute power corrupts absolutely. You, you, you get it and you're like, oh, I want more. I, I, want, I want the new thing, right? The greater thing, the better thing. Um, and so we have this concept of not finding rest and fulfillment in God and looking to the things of the world that I think Jesus is, is teaching us about here. Um, but we also have uh, this being set in Israel's worship life. So where do we actually find the fulfillment that we need? It's in there, right? It's in the church. That's why I under, while I understand why people, some people are still nervous to come back to God's house 
we can't let things stand in those ways. We, I mean, whether you're a, a, a mask person or a non-mask person, whether you think the virus is a big deal or you don't think it's a big deal, uh, all of those pale in comparison to the fact that we know that what we get in there is the biggest of deals, right? Um, and when we separate ourselves from those things, it re does really bad things to us. Um, it, it gives us the inability then to actually process all the difficult things that are happening and bear up under the stress of everyday life. And so we can't remove ourselves from the word. Uh, when we talk about things that are necessary, right, and that's been a big talk, topic, or essential, I think is the word that's, that's been thrown around over the last year, what's essential and what's not. For me as a Christian, I would rather go without food than to go without that. I need that. I can't be a good husband, I can't be a good father, I can't be a good pastor if I'm not in there, if I'm not receiving from God. And this is, I, I made a, a small allusion to this in the sermon this morning, right? We can't, we can't give what we haven't received. And so if, if we're going to give comfort to other people, if we're going to uh, suffer as Christians suffer, right? Uh, not as those without hope, not as those that have to cling to this worldly life with everything that we have, that we actually believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead, not only forgiving our sins, but overcoming all the effects, including death, right? That, then we need to be in there. That's where we get the tools and the strength to do and bear up as Christians. And so it's, as a pastor, while certainly you understand why people are worried, um, it's heartbreaking to watch people keep themselves from God's house, uh, to not want to be in it, or, or even to to uh, not want me to come to their house at the very, very least, right, and to minister to them because they're worried about the virus. And I get the worry, right? Uh, uh, you know, if you ever read the book Chicken Little as, as a child, or uh, maybe it came out after you were a child and maybe you read it to your grandchildren, right? Uh, Chicken Little is the one who's worried that the sky is falling because an acorn hit him in the head, right? It's all about perspective and how we, we frame things. And and our media has framed this in a very certain way, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, I'm not here to, to, uh, to nitpick that because we, that'd probably be a topic we'd never get off and I'd be late for church over at Oklahoma Avenue. But either way, um, we have to trust in God, that he orders all things. And so th those are things that we need to, to keep in mind during, during these things. And part of this is what Jesus is teaching us, right? When we feel those temptations, when we feel that doubt, um, we use his word, right? We don't come up with our own little quips or what I try to explain to uh, even my children or, or confirmation children. Uh, a lot of times something, they've gotten so used to being able to take a phone out of their pocket and Google any answer that this is how they live their lives. I feel anxiety about this. Maybe I'll see what Google says. No. See what God says. Because he talks about this when he says, do not be anxious about anything. Right? Anything. And instead, you're going to go to Google and, you know, get some, I mean, what? we don't even know what you're going to get on the internet. Right? <laughs> Anybody with a computer can get on there and type anything they want to. Right? I could write a blog about how to relieve anxiety. You should actually, you know, uh, stand on your head for 35 minutes. And if you won't feel anxious anymore, probably because you've already passed out, but you won't feel anxious, it'll be great, right? Or uh, a movie that came out in the 1990s called Major Pain. Uh, this guy gets, it's a war movie, a sp kind of a comedy. Uh, and a guy gets shot and he says, let me show you a trick to take your mind off that pain. And he takes and he breaks his pinky. And the guy's like, oh, my finger! He's not worrying about his leg anymore, right? <laughs> These are the things that we find on the internet. Horrible, horrible things. It doesn't actually work. Uh, God's word works, and it works every time. And so that's where we go to. And this is what Jesus is teaching us, right? In the context of not only reading our Bibles and knowing what the word of God says and being able to apply it, but being in God's house and receiving that word while the pastor is applying it to you, right, in your life. Um, those things are necessary. Not to mention the fact that when Jesus sent out the disciples, did he send them out alone and unafraid by themselves? No, how did he send them out, Jerry? Do you remember? With nothing, but he, he sent them out with nothing. Like, don't take an extra tunic, right? Don't, take, don't worry about all of those things. It's an exercise of trust, as Jesus is telling us here. But he also sent them out two by two. 
Because it is that isolation and loneliness that actually is where the devil can come in and really get us, right? What does a wolf do to, a, to pick off a lamb? You got it. You got it. Watch how lions hunt, right? They do the same thing. You break off from the herd, bad things happen. God knows we need a herd, right? He created Eve because he looked at Adam and said, what, Tanner? It is not good for man to be alone, right? When we are by ourselves, we get in trouble. We need the church. We need that family of believers that believe uh, the same that we do, that, that fight the same temptations that we do, that work together for these things. We need that. The isolation is not good. It hasn't been good from the beginning, right? And, and even, in the, even in the midst of that, what happened to Adam and Eve who were standing right beside each other? They still got picked off, right? <laughs> so it doesn't stop it from happening, but at least it gives us strength, right? Could you imagine if Adam actually loved his wife enough to say, hey, honey, I don't think we should be doing this. God, God was pretty clear. Don't eat from this one, no matter how good it looks, right? Could you imagine if Adam would have been a man enough to love his wife enough to, to do that? I'm sure we would have screwed up somewhere else down the line, all right? Maybe not that day. Once again, Satan's not dumb. That, oh, I didn't get them that way. I'll figure out another way. Um, and if any of you have had experiences with uh, repeated temptations to the same sin, you know that that's how he works, right? You, you, you survived that temptation. Whew, I did it. I, I'm, I'm good. Look at me. I didn't do that thing. And then what happens two days later? You're not even thinking about it. And all of a sudden he comes out, knocks your legs out from underneath you. All of a sudden you wake up and you're like, oh, crap, what did I do? Yep. So good, then you do yeah, yeah, literally, I'm so good. I can handle this, and right in the midst, boop. <laughs> we're no good at being God. <laughs> if there's one thing that the temptation taught us, not only of Jesus, but also of Adam and Eve, is we're no good at being God, right? We, we muck it up quite a bit. Uh, and so that, I think that's why these allusions to Deuteronomy are there, to give us this bigger, fuller picture. And once again, why it's important for us to know God's word. If you didn't know God's word, or at least have a pastor to point you in those directions, this is why it's really hard to just be me and my Bible, you may have missed all of that. And look, we just talked for however long we've been going, 17 minutes already, uh, and we haven't even gotten to the second question. Um, 17 minutes unpacking all of the imagery that we saw because of knowing Deuteronomy, and that Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy, right? That's another reason that we need to be together to hear God's word because you can't learn if you have no one to teach you, right? And as St. Paul says, how are they to learn if no one is to teach? And how are they to teach if the teachers haven't been taught and sent, right? Yeah. This is the pastoral office in a nutshell. Okay. Any questions on the allusions to Deuteronomy chapters 6 through 9? There are some, um, some other... Uh, citations that I give you in that number six, and if you would like to look at them uh, throughout the week, maybe a good, a good little devotional uh, time uh, is to kind of meditate on those and think about the connections that we've talked about. So number seven, we're going into the third temptation, chapter four, verse nine. I'll read that real quick for us. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. So where, where does the devil take Jesus? Highest point, of the temple. Highest point of the temple, right? Highest point of the temple. So if we, we think about this, location is pretty important too, right? The allusions to Deuteronomy, Satan knows God's word also. Because uh, if you remember, he's actually used it in uh, the second temptation uh, to kind of push back against Jesus, right? Or, and he's using it here to try to push back against Jesus. He's citing, the devil is citing in, in verses 10 and 11, he's citing scripture. I kind of don't get that temptation. What's tempting about siding off and killing yourself? Um, I, so I think this, uh, it is... <laughs> Because Jesus has pointed to trust in God, the first two, Satan is saying, throw yourself off to show and prove this, this unequivocal trust that you're giving us, right? You're, you know, uh, pride. prove it. Yeah, it's pride. It's, uh, uh, or 
He's trying to use, and, and Satan does this, right? Trying to use the most well-intentioned and good-meaning things, right? There's a reason why we have the idiom, the path to hell is paved with what? Good intentions. Have we heard that, that idiom before? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, a lot of times we have good intentions, right? We intend to do the good thing. We intend to come to church and internalize, and then we get cut off by someone running the stop sign. We give them the middle finger and spout off a few choice words at them, right? We had every intention of leaving this place. I'm going to be a good Christian this week. And all it takes is one to, to muck it up for us. Um, but this is an exercise in trust. And Satan's trying to get Jesus to show trust, right? Hey, God's commanded you that he's going to send angels to guard you. The irony here is what, after, what happens right after the temptations are finished and Satan leaves. Does anybody know? Yep, that's not in Luke's gospel, but I think it's in Matthew's gospel, right? The angels come and minister to Jesus, right? So by Jesus withstanding the temptation, what happens? The angels come and strengthen. So Satan's trying to get him to give in to said temptation in the hopes that the angels will come, and yet the angels come and strengthen after the temptation, which is kind of a neat thing, I think. Um, I think his best shot was the first temptation. Yeah, for sure. From the devil's perspective. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, being mad. Yep. Hunger's pretty, pretty big. Yeah, thing. especially when you haven't eaten for 40 days. I mean, about the kingdom. He already knew his father. Had yep. The kingdom and, and, and he always knew his father would take care of him. So right. In that first one. Yeah, and, and I think that there's also a sense that, that these temptations are for us in a very real sense, right? Not only to, I mean, the first commandment, right? You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things, right? So this, this concept of trusting God no matter what. Um, and I don't think that it's, uh, it's any coincidence that he takes him to the highest pinnacle of the temple. Um, if, if Jesus is pointing to Deuteronomy, which is part of the worship life of the of the Israelite congregation, and then he takes him to the temple and tries to get them, get him to withhold that trust uh, or do it for his own gain at the temple, at the very place where God's presence is. I don't think that there's any accident there. But I also think a lot of this is also for us, for our benefit, to be able to read it, to withstand it, right? So you have um, the daily things that God promises to provide us, that the devil tries to uh, like food and water, right, that the devil tries to tempt Jesus with, power and authority, uh, our pride that, that gets in the way, and then um, trusting in God almost in a foolish, in a foolish manner, right? Um, and when, when I say foolish, I mean uh, literally putting God to the test, right? Father, if you love me, you will do this for me, and then I'll do this, but you will do this thing, right? I call it God in the box syndrome, we like, we like God in the box, right, where we know I'm going to put you here and you're going to do this and I'm going to do this and everything's going to be good, right? Some of us have probably prayed those prayers. Father, if you just get me out of whatever this jam is, I swear I will go to church more, I'll pray more, I'll increase my devotional life, all of those things, trying to make these great bargains with God, but that's not how it works. You are absolutely negotiating. Yep, I think all of us have, right? I, I'll be the first to admit, when my, my, I got to hospice with my dad and I saw my father dying, uh, I, I may not have given specific uh, negotiations, right? I couldn't exactly say, well, I'll go be a pastor, because I already was one. Um, but I said, you know, just, just make him better, right? I'll do whatever you want, just make him better, Uh and I realized very quickly, that's, that's not a prayer in faith. That's not a prayer in faith. If it's my dad's time to go, it's my dad's time to go. It doesn't make it hurt any less, right? Um, and yet, I trust him. I trust God unequivocally. Um, maybe, maybe there was something worse that, that could have happened to my dad, you know, that, that the, I say a quick week. It, from my perspective, it wasn't quick. I don't know how quick it was from my father's perspective, but that week of watching that decline happen. Um, but there could have been something worse down the line, right? I can't imagine uh, having to, to do that in the midst of a pandemic, right? Uh, where he's, you know, 
recovering from surgery or things like that. Um, we've seen how hard that is in our, our world right now to minister in those ways. Well, and so, yeah, man, I had a whole week. That's I tell people all the time that because uh, you get the people that, oh, I don't want to remember my loved one in that way. And I found that I spent essentially every waking moment as my dad's brain went to mush with him. And I would not trade that time for anything other than Jesus, (laughs) right? Uh, For anything. And when I think of memories of my dad, I don't think of those times. I really don't. It's not like like a song comes on and reminds me of my dad and I see him lying there in the bed. I I don't think of those things. It hasn't tainted the rest. It It certainly has not tainted the rest. And yet... That, that week that I had with him, to be by his side, to, to care for him as he cared for me, man, I wouldn't trade that. To be able, as his pastor, to absolve his sin before he met our Lord, holy cow. Yeah, you got the blessing of closure. Yeah, for sure. And, and we, we actually are very bad at this because most of us as Christians are not really good Christians, right? We don't actually, we, we have this aversion to death. That's why I wrote the or published the newsletter that I did last month, right? This aversion to death that we seem to have. Not only in the midst of the pandemic where we're going to, we're going to segregate ourselves and sit in a house. I've seen neighbors that I have not seen come out in a year around here. That's not living. That's clinging to this. I mean, there's no hope there. There's, there's nothing. I can't imagine living like, because it, it's not living, right? You're just simply not dying. Yeah. <laughs> and well, what's the point in that, yeah. right? Um, and so we, we, get, we do get those things that, that happen in this world like that. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, they're certainly not flourishing. No, not flourishing at all, right? And that's, I mean, that's the whole point of this life is, is God gives us these tools to flourish, Um. And, and I, can, I can, there's a couple neighbors that I can think of that, that their TV never goes off. For one year, every time I've passed their house and their curtains have been open, they've been sitting in front of the TV for a whole year. They don't come out to get groceries. They don't come out to go to church. They don't come out to see anybody. No one calls on them because they don't let anybody in their house. And that's the way they sit. That it, we're, we're going on a, we're starting the second year of, of that. That is time you will never, ever get back. Ever. And for those of us that have lost people that we really, really care about, you know how fleeting time with them can be. Right? And so we, we don't get that time back. Uh, this is why I think Luther in whether a Christian can flee from the plague is absolutely right. We as Christians, one, we don't live as as if this thing doesn't exist, right? Now, certainly, we're talking about a disease or a virus that kills less than 1%. The bubonic plague wiped out one-third of the world's population. The world's population. That is a pandemic, (laughs) right? Where we're looking here, two, four, six, seven, right? We'd be gone. They didn't have social media to scare the crap out of everybody, right? Well, they didn't, and they didn't need it. They're literally carting out dead. Yeah, literally carting out dead and making piles and mass graves in the city, burning bodies, right, to try to stem the tide. So you really didn't need social media. The fear was there, right? So, I mean, you think if you remember last year, uh, those overhead aerial pictures of bodies being buried on that island in New York. Um, and people freaked out, freaked out about it. Um, in one sense, you go, yeah, I can, I can get that. I can get how that's yeah, a little bit terrifying. On the other sense, if you actually think about things that have happened in this world, because the plague of the firstborn, man. You wake up and every firstborn son, gone, dead. That's scary. Plague of abortion. Plague of abortion that has killed... It kills almost 100%, especially in those states where they're not allowed to provide any aid if the abortion is botched. It kills 100%. Yeah. Every time. And it's the point, right? Pastor, I got a question. Yeah. Why did he go 40 days without feeding? Like, I know that was kind of a Symbolic. Okay. 
symbolic of the 40, 40 years of the journeying of Israel in the wilderness. Okay. This is Jesus being Israel as Israel should have been, in complete trust, in complete obedience. If you remember when I drew, it's still up there. Tanner, just read the board. <laughs> Israel, Egypt, 40 years wilderness, right? Baptism, death, promised land. Jesus, 40 days fasting after his baptism, death on the cross, ascension to prepare the place. Us, called out of the wilderness of sin by our baptism, complete our earthly journey, die, promised land. They all fit together. He knew what was there. He was just trying to redirect his thoughts. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Get back on topic, yeah. Yeah, Pastor. Right. He, he had to be drinking water. Though. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, the, the, human, the human body would have, would have shut down, right? Can you go 40 days without any food? Or yes, you can. Exercise no, you you can. Um, there have been studies that that have shown that you can do it. In fact, in fact, what well, fasting? If you don't know this about fasting, the first couple weeks are the hardest, and then your stomach shrinks and you no longer feel the hunger that you did before. So it's not like you you know when you feel famished. That's it's not that all the time, right? Uh, you look now. Eventually, your stomach will become distended. And bad things will happen, um, but the, for those of it, uh, those of us that actually do fast, real fasting, not I'm giving up chocolate for Lent or you know <laughs> sh- processed sugar, which is fine. That's great, right? If, especially if you struggle with wanting those things. Um, anything that helps teach you that you have control over your body uh, and that your your bodily urges don't have to control you is a, a good thing. But for those that actually do true fasting. Um, uh, I do, uh, there have been uh, Lent's before where I've done sun up to sundown fasting, no, no food during daylight hours. Um, and yeah, the first two weeks are rough, but eventually you, you become fine. Uh, now, if you do it too long and too often, it will hurt your body. But science has shown that intermittent fasting is good for you actually. Um, and so a lot of the fasting rules and regulations are now proved by science. And so non-religious people are using them and you're like, well, if we just follow the pattern of the church. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for playing, you know, 4,500 years later. Well done. All right. Uh, so Jesus is, um, taken to the, uh, the, what am I trying to say? The temple. That's the word I'm looking for. That fog that I'm telling you about, I can feel it closing <laughs> in right now. So if I stop completing sentences shortly, um, we'll you finish them. Yeah. I don't know what that's going to mean for Oklahoma Avenue's yeah. service, though. So, I mean, Satan, he knew God. Mm-hmm. I mean, he already knew. He knew that Jesus was the Son of God. Mm-hmm. So when he was doing all these temptations, was he... Was he banking on the human side mm-hmm. of Jesus? Yeah. Causing him to. Yep. Yep. That's that's the from from Satan's perspective. That's the whole purpose of trying to trying to come at him, right? And this is where I think if any of you have watched Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, this is where I think it's more really very pointed. That's so the Passion of the Christ is based off of Luke's Gospel, um, and here where it says. Uh, and when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So he wasn't done. So he wasn't done. Um, for one, he, uh, there may have been more than just the three that are recorded, right? Because it says when the devil had ended every temptation. So we only have three recorded, but there may have been much, much more. We don't know how long it actually went on because it's not actually, actually there. But in the Passion of the Christ, uh, does anybody know where Satan shows up next with Jesus? In the movie? Mm-hmm. In the garden. In the garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is agonizing over the cross. The, he, where, where else? When, when's the next time that Jesus is at his weakest? It's in the garden. That's the more opportune time. So now he shows up and you get this dialogue between Jesus and Satan that is... Certainly creative embellishment on the part of Mel Gibson and the writers, but I, I don't think it's outside of the realm of, of 
most likely what probably would have happened, right? Satan showing up, no, you can't do this. You don't want to do this. You don't want to go die. Uh, and really appealing to that human nature. Um, but this is why Jesus had to be both human and divine, like we've talked about before in, in Christology. A mere human being would have been like, yep, you're right, Satan. I don't want to do this. <laughs> hey, can we go back to that whole power authority and <laughs> all of those things? I'll take that. Yeah, is that still, is that door still open? Door number two? I'll take that one. So while Satan knew the Old Testament, mm -hmm. he really didn't get the prophecy. Does that surprise you? Most, most, un, most unbelievers don't get the prophecies, right? If you've got that hardened heart, it's really... This is why Jesus says all the time, and it sounds weird to us, he who has ears, let him hear. You're listening with the ears of faith. And in the ears of faith, you get it. You, you can understand it. Darkness, mind, from understanding the prophecies. I wouldn't surprise me. I mean, what... Because it always seemed kind of like you're marching to your own doom. Now right. You're crucified and you're like, oh, and you're like... Right. <laughs> Do you, not, do you not get it? Yeah, but I mean, that's, it's, what, I mean, what does St. Paul say about the cross, right? It's, it's a, a stumbling block, and it is, right? We, um, and now, I think we got to be careful about causing, uh, having God be the agent of the hardening of the heart. Certainly, he allows it to happen, uh, and this is, I've always had difficulty with this, uh, even in regards to Pharaoh, right? Because it'll say God hardened his heart. Um, but we get, you know, we, uh, in, in Lutheran Bible reading, we have this, you know, th this concept of Scripture interprets Scripture. So we use the more clear sections of Scripture to maybe shed light on the more hazy sections of Scripture. And so you, when, we, when we have um, uh, God hardening the heart of Pharaoh, uh, St. Paul also gives us a little glimpse into this, right? He gives them over to the desires of their heart, is what St. Paul will say. And that is the hardness of the heart. Um, if, you, if you keep striving after certain sins, uh, and you begin to not look at them as sins, and you begin to cling to them, then, then eventually, or as Isaiah talks about it, God removes that hedge of protection around you. You want this bad enough? Fine, you'll get it. Think of Israel and getting a king, begging for a king. God saying, no, this isn't, this isn't what I've had set up for you, but everybody else has got a king. We want a king. And then Saul comes to power, first king, and then what happens? All kinds of great things, right? <laughs> right? We, we pursue the desires of our heart. Now, when, when, when God says in the Psalms, he will give you the desires of your heart, that's only when our heart is aligned to God's heart, when we desire the things that he wants. I think that might be judgment too. And it ends up being a judgment, right? But it's not like God causes this. We bring this upon ourselves, right? Adam and Eve desired to be like God, to know difference of right and wrong. And they ate the fruit because they desired to be like God, and the judgment was pronounced, right? When we desire after those things, we will eventually get them. And it will not work out for us well. Right? And we see this a lot in our society. Right? People that fill themselves up with sex, with drugs, with sex. I already said sex. Uh, sex, drugs, alcohol, things of this world. Um, yeah, yeah, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, I think one of the, the weirdest examples I think of has become this new, new fetish with tennis shoes. You see all these sports people with hundreds and hundreds of pairs of shoes and you think about that and now the new thing is to send out these shoes and to get them designed by some famous shoe designer who slathers them with a little bit of paint or changes a couple colors and now ooh, right this is this is great and, and what happens though when you get this this pair of shoes uh quick story and then we'll have to go so i can get over to oklahoma avenue uh when i was uh younger i loved michael jordan uh, and I wanted a pair of Michael Jordan shoes, like most young boys growing up in the Midwest during the time of Michael Jordan and the Bulls uh, in basketball. And so I saved all summer long, saved up $120 to buy a pair of shoes. And you know what I found out about those shoes? They fell apart just as fast as any other <laughs> pair of shoes I ever owned. Because when you're a 10-year-old kid, you're tough on shoes. And $120 
spun down that toilet and went away. You should have gotten TF flyers because they made you run faster and jump. Up. That's exactly right. It, at least I actually would have had some, you know, increased attributes. I put on those Jordans, and because I wanted them so bad, and they didn't have my size, and I was an impatient little kid, I bought a size too big. And you know what? Instead of making me run faster and jump higher, I was tripping all over myself. Right? They, these things don't fill us up. We get them and we, you know, I think about this with the sports guys that are, you know, the sports stars that are making millions upon millions and they're spending thousands and thousands of dollars on shoes. And they literally have closets full of shoes. And they'll wear them once. And then they'll add to this collection that they have. For what purpose? What good does that do anybody? So you can color coordinate your shoes with your outfit that day? Come on. But that's just, I mean, it just goes to show. We try to fill ourselves up with the things of the world, and we are never satisfied. Ever, ever, ever. Right? Um, and that's what Satan just doesn't, doesn't get. But he also knows that it's easy to trick us, to get us to try to pursue those, those things. And in the pursuit of those things, we inevitably always turn our back on God. We really do. Yeah. We may convince ourselves we're still Christian. Right? A baseball player with thousands and thousands of pairs of shoes in his uh, and his wardrobe may still make the sign of the cross when he hits a home run and give glory to God, right? The optics are good. The optics are good. Yeah. All right, let us close with the Lord's Prayer. I think we got finished with seven. <laughs> actually, hold on. No, I think we actually finished all of these. We did. We talked about all of these. Okay, new notes for next week. All right. We close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.